Hello, I'm Beverly Thompson. Welcome to City Life, dedicated to keeping you informed on Durham's important news and events. Whenever gun violence erupts in Durham, it rocks the entire community. Whether you live in northern Durham County or in the heart of the city, when gun violence happens, it impacts our collective sense of safety, our quality of life, and how others perceive our city. So how does our city's police department tackle this issue, and what can we do to help? Joining me now to talk about what the Durham Police Department is doing to curb violence in Northeast Central Durham, as well as other areas of our community, are Deputy Chief Steve Mahayat and Analytical Services Manager Jason Shees, both with the Durham Police Department. Welcome Chief Mahayat and Jason. Thank you so much for joining me today. Chief, let's get started with you. So many of us were so dismayed when the recent incident happened involving the two ki children who were uh, shot in <coughs> Northeast Central Durham a few weeks ago. But even before that, you know, there was a lot of um, calls to do something to curb um, violence in Northeast Central Durham. Talk to me about what the police department is doing to specifically target that area of Durham. Sure, Beverly, and, and to, uh, we've, uh, the police department's been committed to Northeast Central Durham since 2007. Mm -hmm. um, as many residents know, <clears throat> we began our bullseye operation in 2007. Bullseye was uh, federally funded. Uh, it was a three-year federal grant that gave money towards suppression, prevention mm -hmm. and intervention, as well as reentry. Mm -hmm. And the Durham Police Department was the lead, took the lead agency in the suppression uh, activities. Mm -hmm. We partnered with the uh, Durham County Sheriff's Office the uh, Durham District Attorney's Office, North Carolina Community Corrections, formerly known as Probation and Parole, as well as the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office in the Middle District, and our federal partners, uh, the mm -hmm. FBI. We have officers on the federal, uh, all the federal task forces, FBI, DEA, ATF, and uh, the U.S. Marshal Service. Mm -hmm. And uh, we spent overtime money in, in that particular area, but what most people really don't know, in two th we, the money really didn't start until 2008. Uh -huh. The city used their own funding for 2007. Okay. And Chief Lopez, even though we originally committed to three years, Chief Lopez has said that we are going to stay in the bullseye operation uh, for, for years to come. Mm -hmm. So even though it will end, uh, the federal dollars will end in December, uh -huh. that will, uh, bullseye will continue. Okay. And uh, it's, been, it's, it's been very effective. We've reduced uh, crime significantly in that area. Mm -hmm. and, but you can't uh, devote uh, all the uh, attention towards enforcement. There's been a lot of economic development that's taken place in Northeast, northeast Central Durham mm. in the past four years. Mm -hmm. uh, people buying homes, home ownership, mm -hmm. uh, renovating homes and businesses, new businesses moving in and uh, community involvement. Uh -huh. And so all those things, it's going to take all of those things, uh, all of us working together mm -hmm. to reduce crime mm -hmm. in, in, in that area as well as the city. So just a truly collaborative effort with everybody. Yes. Okay. Jason, uh, talk <coughs> to me a little bit more about Operation Bullseye. Um, tell us about its beginnings, which I believe you just reviewed a lot of, but any more information that you can add to that? Sure, Beverly. Uh, in 2007, the Special Projects Unit of the Police Department came to crime analysis because they were researching gunshot detection systems. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to know from crime analysis if we were to deploy such a system in Durham, where would we put it? Uh -huh. So we started taking a look at different areas of Durham and these systems at that time started at about two square miles of land area. So when we looked at all the possible locations in Durham, we discovered that the highest density of sound of shots fired calls was in northeast central Durham. Uh -huh. But as we looked into it a little bit more, we also saw that the densest area for violent gun crime and gang <coughs> member residences, based upon their last known address, was also in just about the same area of northeast mm -hmm. central Durham. So there was a real spatial uh, correlation and relationship between those three things. So we, uh, we brought that information up to the operations personnel within the department and devised a response plan that Chief Mahai just talked about a little bit. Mm -hmm. And again, what have been the results? Well, th we've been in there for four years now, so at the end of year seven, I'm sorry, at the end of year uh, four, from mm -hmm. 2007 to 2011, violent gun crime in that area has gone down by more than 51%, uh, which is a very significant re result. It's 
considered statistically significant, meaning that it could not have occurred by just mere chance. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but that wasn't the only thing that we wanted to measure. Violent gun crime going down is a big deal. Mm -hmm. But we also wanted to look at other quality of life type issues, street level things that contribute to the root causes of crime, such as prostitution and street corner drug sales. And those showed a very marked reduction as well. Mm -hmm. uh, non-self-initiated types of drug calls, meaning that the, the officer didn't initiate it, it was called in by a resident, those also went down by about 51 percent, and prostitution calls went down by almost 70 percent. Mm -hmm. Huge impact. I know uh, also, <coughs> Chief Mahage, in 2010, the police department get, began a new initiative called the Violent Incident Response. Tell us a little bit about that, how it works. We borrowed that program from the High Point Police Department. Uh, about the end of last year, we sent several commanders to High Point to uh, get training on the program. Mm -hmm. Essentially, if you have a violent incident, such as an aggravated assault, a person shot, within 48 hours, we conduct a, what's called a violent incident review. Mm -hmm. The lead investigator for the case <coughs> uh, uh, chairs the meeting. Mm -hmm. We bring in our intelligence unit, and we try to determine whether we know the parties that are involved in the violence. If we have enough information to move forward, we bring in our partners. Mm -hmm. I mentioned them before, the Durham County Sheriff's Office, North Carolina Community Corrections, and the District Attorney's Office. Mm -hmm. And we bring all resources to bear on those individuals. The violent incident response doesn't necessarily target a particular area. If okay. we have a shooting on a street, you may not see a lot of police presence on the street. Mm -hmm. we, we target individuals, their associates, and groups. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it's really a citywide program. Okay. Uh, we've, we've had very good results from it in, in terms of arrests and guns seized, mm -hmm. but more importantly, each time we've used it, it has stopped retaliatory violence. Uh -huh. So has it been particularly useful in the bullseye target area? Yes, it has. It has been, okay. Um, <coughs> what factors really contribute to violent crime in that area? I think it's, it's, it's the same factors that, that uh, contribute to violent crime anywhere. Um, it's, it's a myriad of, of, of issues. You have people that commit violence um, for uh, to uh, deal with uh, issues in their life, and uh, hmm. it's it's not just a law enforcement problem. I think it requires uh, us to look at education, uh, mental health, mm -hmm. the health, he health issues, and have all of those people working together mm -hmm. in, in in order to reduce it. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people have said, um, <coughs> you know, if there were more police officers in the area, more cars in the area, that that would help curb the violence. Well, I, what I, do you say to that? I can tell you that if we, we could have an officer on every corner mm -hmm. and, and still you're not going to curb the violence. We've had actually police officers sitting on a street and not 25 feet away have a person be shot right in front of a police car. Right. So some individuals really don't care whether there's law enforcement around. Okay. All right then. Uh, I know one concern then since we we're <coughs> talking about this is the fear factor. I mean a lot of people think if you report a crime, retaliation surely is going to happen. Sure. Um, what do you say to those families or, or individuals who are afraid to work with the police department or report crime? That's something that we're very, uh, we recognize uh, uh, and, and that we uh, <coughs> are very concerned about. Mm -hmm. There have been really two issues that we've dealt with recently. Uh, early last year, we had an incident uh, involving a violent crime mm -hmm. where a witness was at, uh, came forward calling 911, thought that they were anonymous by calling 911, mm -hmm. and uh, was, w was actually <coughs> cooperating with investigators. They then heard their voice on the television, and they started receiving threats. And they called the investigator back and said, I can't cooperate any longer. Mm -hmm. And so with the help of the Durham Crime Cabinet and Senator McKissick, new legislation was, was enacted this year which now allows law enforcement agencies to uh, disguise a person's voice mm -hmm. before we give it to the media. Mm -hmm. And once that law was enacted in July, all of the uh, media requests that we've given have been with a disguised voice. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to redact the person's name, their address, and their phone number, anything that would identify them. And now along with that, with this new legislation, we can, we can also disguise their voice. Mm -hmm. Also the Durham Crime Cabinet uh, supported a new legislation that would enhance penalties for uh, witness intimidation and that was put into law this year. And if people really want to call and they want to remain completely anonymous, they certainly can call uh, Durham Crime Stoppers mm -hmm. um, with any information about a crime or individuals that are wanted. And, and Durham Crime Stoppers pays up to $1,200 for any information that leads to, to the arrest of, uh, of, of a felony. Mm -hmm. So we're serious about helping people uh, report crime without any fear of retaliation. Very much so. Okay, all right. Well, Jason, I understand <coughs> that the Crime Analysis Unit recently launched a new online service that features an anonymous tip uh, apparatus as well. Tell me a little bit more about that. 
Uh, sure. The, the name of the crime mapping service is called Raids Online, mm -hmm. R-A-I-D-S-Online.com, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and it can be accessed from the home page of the DurhamPolice.com website. And um, that particular program has a feature where if a resident or citizen clicks on any crime that's on the map, um, it'll bring up a, a pop-up box that shows basic information about that crime, the date and the time, the mm -hmm. location. And at the bottom of that box, there's a, a place where they can click on Submit Anonymous Tip. Uh, and that is through TIP 411. It's completely unrelated to Crime Stoppers. Um, and when they submit that information, it's completely anonymous. No information about them is tracked in any way because it goes through TIP 411 first um, and before it's sent directly to the Crime Analysis Unit. Mm -hmm. And so they are assured of anonymity in that respect. And this is any kind of crime? <clears throat> this is any kind of crime that they can see on, on the map. Uh -huh. And every type of crime that is reported to uh -huh. Durham Police Department is listed on that map. It's updated every single night. Uh, residents can even sign up to have an automated email sent to them every week or every month letting them know about crimes that have been reported in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people who say or might feel it's not important to report any kind of crime, uh, who may not feel like it's not even worth their time? Well, it, it's very important in terms of our analytical staff. Mm -hmm. um, even if somebody doesn't feel like that, this is a, a solvable case. Um, even if they come to that conclusion, it's very important to have that information for our analysts mm -hmm. so they can take a look at commonalities, not only time of day and day of week, but um, particular um, MOs, modus operandi, that mm -hmm. uh, suspects may be using to commit that crime, mm -hmm. and allows them to better predict the most likely areas and times in which additional crimes might occur. Mm -hmm. That allows us to be much more efficient with our police resources. Uh -huh. That allows us to send those individuals out to very targeted areas rather than just random patrol. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about property <coughs> crimes, uh, not just in northeast central Durham, but uh, throughout Durham. Using data from the Crime Analysis Unit, the police department I know recently launched a residence awareness program. Tell our viewers a little bit about that program and how it works. Sure, Beverly, the Residential Awareness Program called RAP, um, that was something based upon a desire to reduce residential burglaries in Durham. Residential burglary is the only index crime that has gone up each of the last two years in Durham. So our Crime Analysis Unit took a look at all of those reported cases from 2010 and determined that when there was a burglary that was committed, mm -hmm. um, the risk of another burglary happening to that same residence or another one within 400 feet within the next two weeks virtually doubled. Wow. So this was a very significant discovery yeah. that allowed us again to put officers in the most advantageous places where crimes are likely to occur in the future. So what we actually did with this is uh, gave this information to our crime prevention unit and when they're given this information now when, in 2011 when one of these uh, such um, locations occurs we give that information to them and they are able to go out with staff, contact the residents in that area, let them know about the risk, let them know of what things that they can do to help make their particular residents um, less desirable. Mm -hmm. And that also allows our uh, investigators to go out with crime prevention, obtain information to help stop residential burglaries before they can really get out of hand in the community. Mm -hmm. So Chief, Tell us a little bit, we have about two minutes left, okay. how um, residents can um, protect their property well, using I, this information. Well, I, I think the main thing, that I, the main point I'd like to get across is residents need to uh, become more involved with uh, Neighborhood Watch. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they have a Neighborhood Watch program in their neighborhood, please join it and become actively involved in it. If they don't have one, then call us and we will help you design one for your particular neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The other thing is to call 911 if you see something suspicious. Our officers respond to, to, to uh, break-ins on, on a routine basis. Um, a lot of times they'll do a canvas in the neighborhood and they'll find out from talking to a neighbor that they saw something suspicious but they didn't think it warranted mm -hmm. a, a call to 911. Mm -hmm. Call us, bother us, that's what we're, th we're there for. Mm -hmm. We'd much rather come to your neighborhood and find out that what you're calling for was really nothing mm -hmm. than to come three hours later and find out that your neighbor, that your, your neighbor was broken into. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is to try to identify your property uh, with serial numbers. If you have serial numbers, write them down, take pictures of it so that if you are a victim, we can then enter that information to the National Crime Information Center mm -hmm. and then hopefully you'll get your property back at some point if it's recovered. Okay, all right. We need to wrap up now, but before we go, tell me 
how can um, our viewers find out more about what the police department does, how they can protect their par property and crime prevention and any other message you want to leave? Uh, certainly visit our website mm -hmm. and uh, also I would encourage people to join their local PAC and mm -hmm. that, that information is on the website as well. Um, if they want to find out more about the police department, they can, uh, we, we run a Citizens Police Academy once per year. So, you know, we encourage people to do that. And we also have a block uh, captains, uh, block watch captains uh, training uh, once a year. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in, in learning more about Neighborhood Watch, you can come to that. And that'll be on our website as well. All right, great. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> we're going to take a quick break now, but coming up next, we're going to take a look at how the police department is working to engage residents and what you can do to get involved to make Durham a safer place for us all. We'll be right back. Get on board the Bull City Connector, a fare free route connecting Durham from the innovation of Duke to the history of downtown to the creativity of Golden Belt. The Bull City Connector is fare free, frequent, and fun, connecting visitors, business travelers, students, and downtown workers to key destinations in and around Durham. So get on board the Bull City Connector Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to midnight, plus Saturdays and holidays. For more information, call 485 RIDE or visit bullcityconnector.org. Without gun violence, people are whole. Without gun violence, families are intact. Without gun violence, communities are solid. Without gun violence, futures are secure. Together, we can reverse the effects of gun violence in our community. Join Project Safe Neighborhoods campaign in the fight against gun crime. A message from the City of Durham Police Department. Coming! Good afternoon, Mr. Thomas. I'm from your credit card company. We suspect several unauthorized transactions on your card. Really? My credit card company? Yes, and we care about your security, so we make house calls. Good news is you give me your social security number and we'll take care of you. Uh, is that all you need? Uh, oh, not quite. We also need your PIN number. <laughs> I forgot. What, what's that on your back? Nothing. Oh, I get it. You're fishing for my personal information, right? <laughs> no. So you can steal my identity, right? No. Then how come you have a fin sticking out of your back? Honey, get my tackle box and rod. OnGuardOnline.gov has tips to help you guard against internet fraud, to secure your computer, and protect your personal information. To be more secure online, log on to OnGuardOnline.gov. Stop. Think. Click. Welcome back to City Life. I'm Beverly Thompson, your host. Reducing and preventing crime, especially violent crime, is everybody's responsibility. We all have a stake in ensuring that Durham is a safe place to live, work, and play. Joining me to talk about how we, as a community, can step up and help in this effort are Lieutenant Walter Tate and Jennifer Snyder, both with the Durham Police Department. Lieutenant Tate is the Assistant Commander of District 1, which encompasses Northeast Central Durham, and Jennifer is the Coordinator of Project Safe Neighborhoods. Welcome, Lieutenant Tate and Thank Jennifer. You for me. Thank you so much for joining me. Lieutenant Tate, let's get started with you. What are your foremost thoughts and perceptions about Northeast Central Durham, uh, in fact, that community, and the challenges that they're grappling with right now? Well, <clears throat> first and foremost, I, I think that uh, the community needs to know that we support them and that officers uh, support them as far as going above and beyond, sometimes the call of duty as far as uh, working in that neighborhood. I think it's a great place to live. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, I live in Northeast Central Durham or East Durham. Uh -huh. um, part of my youth, I grew up in East Durham. Okay. Attended school at Holton uh, Middle School in, in East Durham. So it's home for me, you know, and I feel very comfortable there. Uh, some of the issues that we're grappling with is, is uh, probably developing more uh, community relations, having the community to to partner with the police department more as far as 
interacting more with the police department. Mm -hmm. Okay. What specific strategies have been put in place in Northeast Central Durham, especially uh, since the incident on uh, Driver Street happened? Well, we continue to utilize our bullseye mm -hmm. uh, efforts that we've been uh, using for the last several years. Uh, also, we've increased patrols out there. Uh, we've made contact with community leaders uh, and talked with them. Um, we've also, like I said, incre increased patrols, do doing more license checks out there, and just trying to get the community more involved, mm -hmm. uh, and trying to reinstate their neighborhood watch program also. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing uh, any kind of reaction from that? Well, we're seeing a, a slight reaction as far mm -hmm. as the uh, community le leaders out there. Mm -hmm. They're actually uh, concerned, and the community has shown great concern, so we are receiving some reaction from that. Mm -hmm. um, it's really disheartening um, to even talk about youth being involved in crime, but we know it's a reality. How can the community address the factors that fuel violence among youth? Well, again, partnering with the police department, Mm -hmm. uh, and the efforts that we are trying to uh, do to make the community safer. Uh, having an active neighborhood watch, you know, we have 95 communities listed for neighborhood watch in uh, East Durham and uh, only 35 that are active. So having an active uh, neighborhood uh, watch program is one way that they can actually uh, prevent crime and help reduce crime. Dialing 911 where you hear shots of gunfire, uh, I think our chief stated earlier, Chief uh, Mahayas, Deputy Chief Mahayas stated, you know, go ahead and bug us. That's what we're there for. Mm -hmm. we, we enjoy uh, providing the service that we provide to the community. So go ahead and dial 911 mm -hmm. uh, and you, you can remain completely anonymous if you want to. And if you don't, you can give your name. But we, we encourage people to dial 911 and utilize that system. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. Yes. And I hope that people are listening to that. But tell me, what do you need from residents to achieve a consistently safe community? Uh, the community has to work in all facets uh, to, con to have a safe community, meaning uh, the police department doesn't need to be an uh, uh, agency that locks everybody up. Mm -hmm. We need to uh, have, a, have the, the community to reach out to neighborhood improvement services, reach out to mental health. Every call uh, doesn't need to have a response of take someone to jail. Mm -hmm. um, so if we want the community involved, you know, we don't want to lock everyone up. <laughs> we want them to be active in, in what we're doing. So if it's a mental health issue, then we need to bring mental health in. If it's a social service issue, then social services need to be involved. Mm -hmm. Parks and Rec is another local government agency that provides a lot of services. So I think they need to utilize more of the local government services that are offered to the citizens. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you really want to be a partner in the neighborhood. We do. We really do. That sounds really good. Do. Jennifer, let's talk to you now. Tell me about Project Safe Neighborhoods and uh, how it works in the community. Okay. Project Safe Neighborhoods is a national initiative mm -hmm. that connects citizens with local, state, and federal law enforcement representatives in the effort to reduce gun crime. Mm -hmm. So can residents really make a difference in reducing gun crime? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I don't think that residents recognize the power that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if they recognize that power and seize that power and utilize it to work with our law enforcement officers, I think we'd see even greater things happening mm -hmm. um, in keeping Durham a safe place to live. Our law enforcement officers have all kinds of tools and operations at their disposal and um, are out there doing everything they can suppression wise um, and with community policing, but heavily rely on citizens to report crimes and to become those active engaged partners. So Jennifer, how can Durham residents be active engaged partners in the fight against crime, especially gun crime? There, there are a number um, of, of ways, and they're all really very commonsensical. Um, as you've heard several times today, simply by calling 911 mm -hmm. when you see suspicious activity, criminal activity, and as we've also heard, by doing so anonymously, if, if that's what you want to do. Um, not turning a blind eye on friends or family members mm -hmm. that may be engaged in criminal activity, going ahead and making that report. Um, also, by locking up legal firearms that might be in your home and by photographing the serial numbers on those firearms so that you have that for reference mm -hmm. in case they're stolen. Teaching children not to touch a firearm mm -hmm. and to seek help immediately by a trusted adult, a parent, or a caregiver if, um, if they do discover a firearm. Not buying firearms for anybody other 
than yourself. Mm -hmm. And then finally, by supporting Project Safe Neighborhoods initiatives okay. um, in the city. All right. Well, what kind of Project Safe Neighborhoods uh, initiatives can people get engaged in? There, we're operating a, a couple of things at all times. Whenever the city experiences a homicide or a especially violent crime, we conduct a community response, which is an initiative that partners residents with law enforcement officers and we go door to door in the affected neighborhood and we speak to the residents, we inform them of the incident, giving them all the up-to-date, accurate information that we can provide at that time, and then offering them support mm -hmm. as well. Right now, we have um, pretty good participation by our community partners, Project Safe Neighborhoods partners. Um, we've got the North Carolina Child Response Initiative clinicians that go out with us. We've got North Carolinians Against Gun Violence representatives that go out with us. We have um, Durham Tech criminal justice students have started oh. to join us in, right. in this partnership. We've got one or two volunteers from uh, PAC-2, one or two volunteers from PAC-3, but we would always appreciate you know, more participation by concerned citizens mm -hmm. and Partners Against Crime members. We also conduct uh, awareness events or workshops from time to time, and the public is also invited always to those okay. events. Well, how can people find out more about uh, gun crime data and even find out more about Project Safe Neighborhood events? Right. We, um, we have a Project Safe Neighborhoods website, and okay. that's part of the Durham Police Department website. That web address is www.durhampolice.com backslash PSN. Whenever we have a community event, something going on that the public is invited to, that information is uh, advertised on the police department website, as well as our Partners Against Crime listserv. And I can always be reached at 560-4438, and my extension is 29230. All right, great information. If you would like to leave our viewers with any one important message, about um, what they can do to be active participants in the, the whole fight against gun crime and violence in Durham. What would you tell them? I would tell them to be active in everything that the, that the community is doing. And Durham Police Department has a lot of non-traditional initiatives that we are currently involved with. And North Carolina Child Initiative Response Program, uh, the great unit. Um, we have the PALS League, and we also have the Crisis Intervention Team. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, very important for kids to participate in activities such as PALS, the Police Athletic League, mm -hmm. because we teach them educational uh, values as far as um, intervention, prevention. And that's big. Great uh, is gang resistance uh, education and training. Mm -hmm. And they work in the Durham Public Schools. They have several schools where they teach a curriculum. Uh -huh. And they also teach prevention and intervention, mm -hmm. so uh, and prevention against violence. So those are great uh, initiatives mm -hmm. for parents to have their children involved in uh, to help prevent uh, violence. The crisis intervention team works heavily with uh, NAMI and the Durham Center, and that is uh, catered towards the mental illness. Mm -hmm and how to appropriately respond to cases and calls uh, where we have to interact with someone with a mental illness. Mm -hmm. So again, those are great programs and I encourage everyone to uh, be involved with them. Mm -hmm. And your website address is? Uh, for the police department is www.durhampolice.com. Uh, all right, all right. And Jennifer, any final thoughts from you? Um, I think just echoing on what Lieutenant Tate said, just to trying to get the citizens to become active, engaged partners. I, I think uh, we will make great strides if the citizens join our law enforcement representatives and, um, and keeping our community safe. All right, great. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And Thank this is great information for our viewers to have. That does it for this edition of City Life. If you have a comment or a future show idea, email us at publicaffairs at Durham nc.gov or call us at 560-4123 and don't forget to like DTV8 on Facebook and follow DTV8 on Twitter to find out how to tune into this show, City Hall This Week and all of the city's programming. You can also watch DTV8 on demand at durhamnc.gov slash DTV8. I'm Beverly Thompson. Thank you for joining me to learn more about city life in Durham.